Leia here from LeiaForSci.com and in this video we'll look at how to identify major and minor resonance contributing structures. This is video 3 in the resonance series. You can find all the videos along with a practice quiz and study guide by visiting my website LeiaForSci.com resonance. In video 2 we looked at different molecules and their resonance forms to learn what key patterns to identify and where to move your arrows. But once you come up with more than one structure where they don't look alike, how can you tell which is the major contributing structure and which is the minor contributing structure? And the answer is not to memorize rules. Instead, the answer is to understand the stability of each contributing structure. In organic chemistry and in life, it's important to recognize this key, key principle. If a molecule is happy, meaning it's stable, it's going to be unreactive. If it's comfortable with where it is, it has no desire to change its situation. But if it's unhappy, it's unstable, and it wants to change its situation, making it very reactive. So as you're looking at the resonance contributing structures, ask yourself, which one is more stable and which one is less stable? And more importantly, why is it more stable and why is it less stable? The first rule to look out for is minimize charge. Charge is a burden. A positive charge and a negative charge is a burden to atoms, and if you can avoid having charge, then the molecule will be more stable or happier. When minimizing charge, keep in mind the concept to avoid separation of charge. A positive and negative charge next to each other will attack. The negative will attack the positive in an effort to get rid of charge. Going back to the principle of charge is a burden, let's get rid of it. We looked at the resonance for propanone, where we decided that the pi bond can be broken to collapse the electrons onto oxygen, giving me a resonance structure that looks like this. Oxygen with an extra lone pair and a negative charge, carbon with an incomplete octet and a positive charge. The net charge on both sides is zero, so it is a viable structure. But in terms of which one is more stable, the one on the left has absolutely no charge. If charge is a burden, it's not carrying that burden. The one on the right, not only does it have a positive and a negative charge, but it also has a separation of charge, two opposite charges next to each other. In fact, this structure is considered so unstable that the negative charge will attempt to attack the positive charge, giving me the neutral molecule as the ideal resonance form and therefore the major structure. On your exams, we'll call the neutral one major, and the charged one minor. Now what does this mean in terms of the resonance hybrid? If we said that in reality it doesn't exist as both. What you want to think of is that yes the resonance hybrid is going to be some intermediate of the two but that intermediate will look much more like a pi bond and much less like the separation of charge. So rather than having something exactly in the middle you'll tend to see more of the pi bond there with a very slight negative at the top and a very slight positive on the carbon. Now keep this in mind because in reactions when you hear a carbonyl carbon is partially positive this is what we're talking about. This is where it gets its partial positive charge. Let's look at the molecule ozone. In my Lewis structure video I showed you how to set up the Lewis structure where we came up with a positive and negative charge. A negative charge on the oxygen with three lone pairs and a positive charge on the oxygen with three bonds and one lone pair. We can show resonance where a lone pair on the negative oxygen reaches to form a pi bond between itself and the positive oxygen, causing a pi bond between the positive and neutral oxygen to collapse towards the right. Start by redrawing the skeleton, showing everything that didn't change, then let's add in the changes. The green electrons form a pi bond, and we'll show these as red electrons forming a lone pair on the right oxygen atom. We still have a positive on the central oxygen and a negative on the oxygen to the right. But here's another structure that we could show. Instead of showing the negative oxygen forming a pi bond to the positive oxygen, we can show the electrons from the pi bond simply collapsing onto the oxygen atom so that there are only single bonds in this molecule. The only thing that changed is that we get a pink lone pair to the oxygen on the right. But look what happens when we work out the formal charge negative 1 for oxygen on the right and left because they have the extra lone pairs, 
The oxygen in the center should have six electrons attached to it, but I only count four. A quick formal charge tells me six minus four is positive two, and we still have a net charge of zero, but look at the separation of charge on this molecule. This is going to be a very, very, very minor structure because it's so unstable. These two are the same, so we don't have to rank them. But now these two are also the same because they each have a negative oxygen and a positive oxygen in the center. So for this structure, we really have one major, which can be shown right or left, or you can call them two majors if you want to differentiate between the oxygen negative on the right and negative on the left, and then a very minor structure because we have way too many charges going on. The next rule to keep in mind is electronegativity. An electronegative atom is one that likes and wants electrons. So it makes sense that the more electronegative the atom, the more likely it'll be to hold a negative charge, and therefore the happier it'll be to hold a negative charge. If you have an atom that is very low in electronegativity, it'll prefer to hold a positive charge, meaning it'll be more stable holding that positive charge. Let's take another look at the ketone. We showed the resonance where the pi bond will collapse onto the oxygen atom, giving it an extra lone pair. A quick formal charge gives me a negative on oxygen and a positive on carbon. But there is another way that you can show this. You can take the pi bond and collapse it down onto carbon instead of up onto oxygen. The resulting structure only has two lone pairs on oxygen, an extra lone pair on carbon, with a negative one on the carbon atom and a positive one on the oxygen. In terms of conservation of atoms and charge, they work. The atoms are all there, we didn't break any sigma bonds, and the net charge is zero on each structure. But look at the difference in electronegativity. Remember in the Orgo Basic series, I had you memorize the following atoms and their placement on the periodic table. We have hydrogen, carbon nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, then phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, then bromine, then iodine. I had you remember the trends where electronegativity goes up and towards the right and size is down and towards the left? Well, this is one of those situations where knowing this table will help you. If electronegativity goes up and towards the right and the two atoms we're comparing are carbon and oxygen, oxygen is to the right of carbon, making it more electronegative. Carbon is to the left of oxygen, making it less electronegative. The goal is to have the negative charge on the more electronegative atom, so the positive charge should go on the less electronegative atom. That means oxygen would rather have the negative charge and carbon would rather have the positive charge. So for this molecule, the neutral structure is the major contributing structure because no charges are better than distributed charges. The second or minor structure would be a negative oxygen and positive carbon. And the very, very minor, you probably don't even have to show this on your exam, is a negative carbon and a positive oxygen. Not only does this structure have a separation of charge in the wrong direction, we're also violating the next rule, which is to pay attention to your octets. The octet rule tells you that an atom wants to have eight electrons in its valence shell through lone pairs or bonds. If you set up a resonant structure where you're violating that octet by putting in too many electrons if it can't handle it, or taking away electrons so that it does not have a complete octet, it won't be stable. Atoms in period three and lower are larger and can have more than eight in their octet. The common atoms that want to have eight and only eight are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Remember that within these atoms, electronegativity goes towards the right. And the more electronegative the atom, the less likely it is to hold a positive charge. So when you see these atoms, carbon being the least electronegative of all of them is okay with a positive charge, but you do not want to have a positive charge due to an incomplete octet on oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. If you have resonance that puts an extra bond on oxygen or nitrogen to give it a positive charge, but still have a complete octet, that's okay. So let's go back to this example and notice that carbon has a complete octet. It has two, four, six electrons in bonds to carbon and oxygen, two electrons as a lone pair for a total of eight. But oxygen only has six in its octet instead of eight. We have two in the bond, two more for each of the lone pairs for a total of six, 
and oxygen being more electronegative than carbon will be very, very unhappy with an incomplete octet and a resulting positive charge. You definitely want to keep this in mind when you're trying to decide which electrons to use in resonance. For this molecule, we have three nitrogen atoms that each have a lone electron pair. And the question is, which one do we use to start the resonance? First notice that if we cut it down the middle, we have symmetry. So the nitrogen on the right and left are the same. The question then is, do we use the upper nitrogen, which will show with purple electrons, or the lower nitrogens with the red electrons? If we try to use the purple electrons, then we'll violate the octet for carbon as follows. Everything stayed the same, but we now have a triple bond between nitrogen and carbon. Carbon now has a total of 10 electrons in its octet. Octet means 8. 10 are not allowed. But nitrogen still has a complete octet because it has 4 bonds and 8 electrons. Another clue to help you recognize that this is incorrect is a quick formal charge on nitrogen. We have a total of 4 electrons, should have a total of 5, giving us a charge of plus 1. Carbon should have a total of 4 directly attached. Given that we have 5 bonds, there are 5 directly attached. 4 minus 5 is negative 1, and everything about this should scream something's wrong. So let's try it again, and this time we'll use the red electrons. If these electrons move towards the sp2 hybridized carbon, it would again violate the octet, but this time carbon can compensate by taking the green pi electrons and collapsing them as a lone pair onto nitrogen. The resulting structure has a pi bond between the left nitrogen and carbon, and then an extra green lone pair on the upper nitrogen atom. A quick formal charge tells you that the nitrogen on the left has a positive charge. Carbon had four bonds, still has four bonds, the octet is obeyed and it's good to go. Nitrogen on top now has a negative charge due to having another lone pair on the top. And check it out. Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So if it's a choice between putting a positive or a negative on nitrogen, we prefer to have the negative instead of the positive. For even more practice, make sure you check out my resonance practice quiz on my website, along with this entire video series and study guide by visiting layerforsci.com resonance. And be sure to join me in the next video where we look at radical resonance, which is the movement of a single electron. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for resources and information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, then I have a deal for you. A free copy of my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry. Use the link below or visit orgosecrets.com to grab your free copy. After downloading your free copy of my ebook, you'll begin receiving my exclusive email updates with cheat sheets, reaction guides, study tips, and so much more. You'll also be the first to know when I have a new video or live review coming up. If you enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up and share it with your organic chemistry friends and classmates. I will be uploading many videos over the course of the semester, so if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, do so right now to be sure that you don't miss out.